Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our virtual opening reception featuring locations, recent works by Marion Bingham. Um, my name is Eileen Donovan, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement with the Lyman Allen Art Museum. Um, just a couple of notes of Zoom etiquette this evening. Thank you for staying on mute for the main portion of the program. Everyone is welcome to submit questions in the chat. Um, while we're reviewing the exhibition and hearing from Marian Bing, um, Bingham about her, her works of art. Towards the end of the program, the last 10 or 15 minutes of so, um, we'll let folks even ask questions and unmute themselves and turn on their video if they so please. Um, but with that and those introductory notes, I'm gonna pass it off to Sam Quigley, the director of the Lyman Allen Art Museum. Hi, gang, and so glad to see you all here on a cold and wintry night. Um, I hope you're all very safe and warm. Obviously, you have power, so that's not an issue, right? Uh, but in any case, we're delighted that you're here, um, or so to speak, here, and joining us in this opening of the show, uh, Locations Recent Work by Marion Bingham. As uh, you may know, this is part of our near new contemporary series. Um, and it's because that we are so very fortunate here in southeast, southeastern Connecticut, there are so many artists who are producing strong work uh, that reflects the beautiful surroundings we have in a very fresh vision. So we designed this new, near new series in direct response to them. And we hope to celebrate recent work by the artists among us. That's my little phrase and uh, it seems to work out. Um, we're not trying to refer to anybody as local um, and uh, yet we really recognize that we're very fortunate to have them nearby as neighbors. Um, Marion Bingham or Bing as she is known to most of us uh, is one of these artists who is particularly well uh, cultivated in uh, representational techniques, and she renders nature and familiar subjects in a wholly distinctive and I find an extremely charming manner. Um, we have loved working with Bing for many years, and uh, it's regrettable that she decided to decamp to go to California, but I fully understand why, uh, back to her roots, so to speak, after all. Um, and given the weather, actually, I guess I'd like to be there too right now. Um, but in any case, we will forever consider her our own uh, decades here in Connecticut and gracing us with her art and her presence. So um, she will always be near, near to us and near to our heart. Um, and so thank you, Bing, for letting us put on a show of your work and supplying it to us uh, so graciously. We really appreciate it. Um, I also would like to thank a number of other people, uh, especially Tanya Port, who is our curator. Uh, Tanya seems to be able to do everything all the time, and uh, this is just the uh, third uh, show that we've been working on this month, after all, uh, closing the Way Sisters recently and opening the Norman Ives last week. And we'll, we'll take a little break, I hope, but then we're off to the races for some more work. Jane Legro, our director of exhibitions, I am deeply indebted to as well uh, for all of her design and her organization and her hard work in overseeing the installation uh, crowd crew. Um, Becca Dawson, who is our director of communications and, and visitor services, provides all of the design uh, for our communications and gets the word out. Um, we're deeply in great, indebted to them all. People you don't normally see are particularly important as well. And those are the uh, trustees uh, who are behind the scenes and make things happen. Uh, we're very grateful to them. And of course, you know, I have the best staff in the entire world here at the museum. We're punching way above our weight class um, and having a lot of fun doing it too. My final thanks is to uh, the, the state of Connecticut and particularly the Department of Economic and Community Development 
and an anonymous foundation, which helps us out with all of our, our exhibitions. So we have a lot to be thankful for. And now having gotten um, those words out, I'd like to jump into the program. Um, we have uh, created a little movie, gives you a sense of the way the exhibition looks in terms of the gallery layout. And then you'll have a chance to see individual images. And I think at that point, uh, Bing may make a couple comments about them. And then I hope, as uh, Eileen said earlier, uh, people will feel free to either pose questions for the chat room or uh, directly uh, using that old fashioned thing that we call the voice. Um, uh, you, I'll just have to remember to um, unmute yourself when you get around to that. So without further ado, I'm gonna to try to share, share my screen and there it is. And we'll get this show on the road. Here we go. As I said, we'll start with a video.
if I misspelled her name. Okay, so shall we go see some individual works in the exhibition? Sam, is this a time that you want me to comment on some of these? Absolutely, feel free, yes. Okay. Um, the previous ones and this one are are prints. Um, these are these two and a little collection on the wall are uh, collaged materials that I sort of find sometimes even um, a paper of a chocolate wrapper or something uh, in the right on the left hand side. The doormat says, "Thank you for your visit" in French, and I had some little prints that I added into the whole mix. <clears throat> but it's, it's a playful and kind of an exploratory way of working. Um, and the next one, the horse is, is purely a lithograph. It's, uh, I do unique lithographs. In other words, they are very limited. Um, at the most, they may be a series of three. Uh, this is one of two and it's very large. Um, thankfully, they've put it up in the front hall of the of the museum, and I'm sure that that's a, to those who are able to go in and see it. It's uh, quite a you know a nice piece of of work. Uh, and Sam, I don't know what the next <laughs> I can't this remember the series. Okay, so this is a outside too. this is a combination of the lithograph technique in the middle and collaging and uh, uh, gilding also on, on the edges. An oil painting. Uh, in France, often we would see these planted poplars that, uh, these long lines of trees, very beautiful. Um, I was inspired by some marbles that I saw, and they were so classical. And I thought of the, the classical aspect being so connected with civilization and its stability and uh, his last, its lastingness that um, in contrast to the everyday experience of sort of the unknown, what's you're diving into a pool uh, of the unknown with a certain amount of astonishment. It just, I was playing with sort of that intriguing idea as I did this. The Connecticut shore. Like you said, we're so lucky to live around here and you've mm -hmm. it so beautifully. <coughs> And this was an area in France, uh, it's called the Lauragais. It's very agricultural with rolling hills and often there are fields of um, mustard or culsa it's called, uh, they use for oil. And off on the right is the village that we lived in up on a, a very sharp area, great views. And I was inspired by the lines of trees along the road and, and this ever-changing agricultural area. Again, uh, inspired by France. Uh, the panels are each a different season, um, starting with winter on the left. And I think that's sort of, it's something to explore because there are, there are horses in each one, sort of in little, uh, not so hidden, but the, the landscape definitely takes over.
This is a very interesting piece, and I hope you, you visit the museum because um, I came to know while in France a wonderful woman, Madame Fontenay, and she was a writer and an artist. And I had my studio in her home, and she took a look at this piece. And a few days later, she came with a poem, and the translation of the poem is on the wall in the museum, and it's very poignant and very beautiful. She was a very classical uh, poet. A great experience to know her. Unfortunately, she's no longer alive. And this is an upcoming show. I hope you will have an opportunity to visit. Um, it's right up the hill from the Lyman Allen Museum. And um, it's a beautiful room of the Chu, uh, Charles Chu Asian Art Reading Room. And uh, I'm going to be having a show there of some work that I did many years ago when I was living in Hong Kong in the Philippines as well and uh, studied Chinese painting. And they are giving me a show of these older work, which is very exciting. I think there are a couple of pictures of what will be shown, yeah. I must say, Bing, I did not realize how accomplished you were in this medium. I love well, the uh, Yi Bing Yuang is doing a really fantastic job and doing some research on the teachers that I had, which I had, well, Charles Chu, who many of you in Connecticut know, and um, the teacher that I had in the Philippines, who fortunately came to the United States and became quite a prominent uh, professor at, um, I, I think it was William and Mary or a, a, a university. And uh, so it's really, and my father was very influential in my uh, studying and enjoying Asian art. And so Yixuang, I mean, uh, Ye Bing has taken a great deal of trouble to put something really quite special together. And I hope you all can enjoy that. Definitely. I think there's another, yeah, there's another one. This is so exciting thing and it's really <laughs> extraordinary work. And I think a great opportunity, you know, to see this very early work of yours and the way you know, your, your interests have grown and shifted um, sort of as your, your artistic um, skills have, have increased and in, in kind of turned in different directions, um, you know, perhaps in response in part to, to your travels um, and, you know, your, your various accomplishments. And I wondered, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about this journey that you've, you've taken as an artist and sort of, um, you know, this beautiful range of work that's represented in our exhibition and in this upcoming exhibition um, up uh, in, in the Chu Room at Connecticut College. Mm. Uh. That's kind of a big question, <laughs> but whatever, I think, you know, your, your thinking and, you know, it's a big question is, would be. I, I think the whole journey started at nine years old. I was fortunate enough to be in Europe and uh, being the youngest of the children in the family, uh, I was with some people would think dragged to museums along with everybody else. And um, I didn't find it dragging at all. It was a huge inspiration and I, uh, I don't know if I proclaimed it vis vocally, but in my heart, I said, you know, this is what I want to do. I, I want to become an artist. And it wasn't specifically sculpture or painting or anything like that, but it just was like, this was such a uh, opening. And um, so when I traveled to Asia with my parents and then later lived in Asia, I was fortunate enough to find artists um, who could teach me Chinese painting. And the reason that I uh, both was in Asia and 
uh, became so interested in that is my father was a professor of Oriental history and his specialty was China. And so we were sort of imbued with this uh, cultivation of Asian work, artwork and uh, the interest in Asia. So I think what is most interesting about looking back at this uh, period that uh, Yi Bing is bringing forth is that it really has influenced looking and observing and reflecting on uh, art and producing art so that I think one of the major parts is space. I've often talked with some of the artists uh, both in Europe and here about how um, so much art is so crowded that there's no breathing room in it. And um, we're all, you know, I can't say that all of my paintings have breathing room, but I'm very aware of, of space and distance and perspectives and uh, Chinese painting has that element of, of space and openness that is so very interesting. Is that covered enough? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think we could see, you know, some themes that that have continued that it seems, you know, were were born in that moment. Um, your a few of the images in the the calligraphic pieces show animals and mm. um, trees. You know, the sort of interest in the natural world um, that that you know, certainly is, continues um, in, in your more recent work. Is that something that, that you were conscious of as you've, you've evolved as an artist? I think it's more just what, and I think most artists feel that it's not a conscious drawing to a particular topic. Mm -hmm. uh, it really comes from your heart. Um, I think the, the more recent work that sort of revolves around horses is certainly involves my having had a farm that had a lot of horses on it. And uh, even as a growing up, I would ride with my father or when I was in high school, I rode. Uh, I don't ride now and I haven't for quite a while, but the whole spirit of the horse and the, its way of expressing certain feelings that I have rather than using a human figure or other means to express that um, is kind of exciting and it's it's a very challenging topic subject yeah <laughs> you have a very interesting absorption of these different environments and spaces that you've worked in is there a particular space, be it Connecticut, California, France, or, or in Asia, where you found it challenging to work in that particular and reflect that environment? Was there one that was a more natural approach? Um, anything in, in terms of re relating to these different spaces? I think, um probably the most inspiring was France as far as color and the variety. The, certainly the United States has a great deal of variety, but it's spread out. It's very hard to get from one change you know, landscape type to another. Whereas in France, you can go a half an hour and you can be very, very different. Um, and the air and the light color is very exciting. And I think, uh, the other atmosphere part that you don't see is if you say you're an artist in France, it, you're automatically sort of part of the club. I um, mm -hmm. don't know how else to say it, but it's sort of like, yes, we know what that's all about, you know, and they put a certain degree of excitement. Um, a little harder to find that here where people are much, if you said you were in business or in investing, you know, people would go, oh, yes. You know. Um, so, uh, I think as far as choosing a landscape, um, I'm, I'm delighted. I enjoy just observing the places that I'm in and, uh, but certainly France and, and to also 
California has the views and the space spatial feeling that I really enjoy. You also um, in one of the earlier works that was highlighted is this was a collage of different materials and you could buy more materials integrated into other works um, featured in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, painting seems to be the obvious dominant of your work, but how do you approach different materials um, when incorporating them into paintings or working entirely separately? Uh, it's the, the only way I really incorporate in an oil painting a different element is that often I put um, either a great deal of texture on the, on the canvas before I start working or I collage a space so that um, you have sort of a framing on the outside of the painting. Uh, I can kind of, I can show you, I will back up uh, some work that I'm working on now. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see it too well, but there's a definite framing along the edges here because there is an actual edge to the to the piece that I've put onto the canvas. Uh, as far as working with prints, I like the idea that a flat piece of work has some kind of dimension to it. And that's one reason that I began to use this texture and uh, the element of putting something on a canvas. Um, as far as the collaging, it's the same sort of thing. There's, it gives a different feel to a piece of paper if you have something a little bit more on it than just paint. So that's one of the excitements. Also, I think the prints and the paper work have a whole other means of expression than when you're painting and you're just doing little you know, you're taking a brush and adding little bits of, of color. Whereas with collage, you can cut out a whole piece of paper. You have a whole spread of pattern or something um, that you wouldn't necessarily get unless you did some very meticulous work in oil painting. Thing I know that um, printmaking looms large in your work as well. And I know you worked a great deal down in Greenwich. Um, have you uh, found mm -hmm. a place to work in now Sausalito? I think you have, yes. Yeah, this is a most amazing uh, studio. Um, I'm in a building with probably over 100 artists mm. who are all working at various uh, levels and with various materials and uh, there are a couple of, I've only been here uh, four months, but I'm learning that there are sculptors. I, I share a studio with a sculptor um, and another painter. We have this huge room with a skylight and some wonderful windows that you can kind of see some of the light coming in. Uh, and um, it's, it's a very exciting environment where people are all, there's a photographer right next door. Uh, there are new, new artists, young artists and older ones. I think the, the studio I share with the sculptor, she's been here over 40 years and this has been her primary uh, studio and she's been here longer than anybody else. So she has some real tales to tell me about the art world out here. So it's really a great experience. It seems to me that you might be feeling a bit more like in France again. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Hundredfold. Okay. It's exciting to think about being part of, of this sort of rich artistic community. Yeah. Um, and it seems like, you know, hearing about the, um, the work that you did very early in your career, you know, working under um, several other artists and, mm -hmm. and learning the craft was, you know, very much a kind of interactive experience. Right. Um, and so it's exciting to think of, you know, being able to, to continue that at various junctures in your mm -hmm. life, you know, to kind of 
feel like you're collaborating um, and sharing ideas and experiences with other artists. Right. Um, and is this something that really kind of helps push your work in new directions, do you think? I really haven't had a chance to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in the past, you know, well, is this yes, definitely I mean, generative process? Um, I think it's a growing, it's a growing process, yeah. uh, certainly. And it's exciting to have uh, the interrelationships with other artists. Sometimes you're able to give them special um, inspiration. There's one artist in France who was who uh, did wonderful drawings and had experience in painting some years before. And we were able to go out and do drawing outside together and spend some time together. And uh, she suddenly found sort of her place, her style, and was starting to show when I left. So it, it was that was very exciting. That part is a nice element. Great. Well, with all this discussion of living artists, I, I hesitate, it's always dangerous to ask about precedence and all, but I must say, I was struck by uh, resonances of Matisse in some of your work. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that uh, he has been uh, any one of the influences that you particularly call out? Uh, I'm thinking of the still lifes, so, you know, the, the, the window, the chairs by right. the window, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, I think um, Chagall also the whole idea of sort of adding the horses into it, whether they are pink, blue, orange, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I've not done any upside down yet, but that might come. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people occasionally have said, oh, it's sort of like Chagall to sort of find a figure in the sky or um, I think we all have the tremendous advantage of seeing other artists work like Picasso's work, even though we haven't been in front of the painting, we are confronted with artists work from all over the world. And that's very exciting. It's very inspirational. I'm always interested in, you know, thinking about the his, the rich history of art and the whole wide range of influences. And I love in your four seasons, you know, the way there is this, this kind of continuous narrative, you know, within this, this um, contiguous landscape, you know, it's a shifting of seasons and a, a kind of story that un, unveils itself um, as you kind of progress from the left to the right. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that piece. Um, you know, it has such a kind of intense dramatic sky. And I know there's a, a sentence or two that you included with um, the, the label text talking about how you began that project on the anniversary of 9-11 right. and sort of, you know, being in France, but maybe reflecting a little bit on things happening in America at the same time. Right. Well, actually, I painted that when we were living in Greenwich, and I had put the sky in on the anniversary of 9-11. And I had done some drawings of landscape in France, which then sort of percolated and became seasonal and <clears throat> stretched out into that 16-foot painting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of a combination, but it's definitely a, uh, oh, thank you, Sam. Uh, it's, it's a painting of combined forces, so to speak. But uh, I didn't mean for the sky to uh, become a tragedy, but it kind of was because it was on the anniversary of 9-11, it became a sort of a force in itself. And uh, it was lovely to put something sort of poetic underneath it that was, uh, to which touches you all seasons. And it was a challenge to, to make it come together. And it was a great deal of fun to paint. 
Um, it's, it's lovely to see it in amazing. person. Great deal of fun to look at, yes. It is, it is. Because, right, it's sort of these contained vignettes, mm -hmm. but yet, you know, they they do all connect um, in exciting ways. And the texture in this, as you said, you know, your interest in kind of three-dimensionality and texture comes out when you can when you can stand in front of these pieces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's nice so. for you to say. <laughs> Hopefully we're encouraging, you know, uh, <laughs> visitors to come and see the show in person yeah. is, it is really rewarding um, in a way that, you know, a screen limits us a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also um, kind of exciting for me to sort of see this as a presentation that I know other people are looking at because often as artists, we are confined to our studio to get work done and you sort of live through the experience of the painting and then you wonder if anybody's ever going to see it. So mm -hmm. it's very exciting for me. Not only it's in the museum, but it's also being seen today on screen. And by the way, this uh, is being recorded. So not only will the PowerPoint and the movie be available mm -hmm. to other people on our website, but so will this entire opening as a matter of fact. That's so. great. I think another aspect oh. that is hard to convey on the screen, but that really is apparent in person is this sort of shift in scale between some of your work. You know, this piece, as you've said, 16 feet long is perhaps, you know, the largest piece in the show. And then um, in the vitrine and the case in the center of the gallery, there are some of these little micro prints. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about kind of that that shift in scale, you know, that you you range, you have a really broad range in the work that you do. Um, you know, uh, what it's like to kind of create something very large scale and then, you know, think mm. small at, this, at, at other moments. Well, it's a challenge to do anything that's, you know, two inches by four inches. But uh, so much of one's sort of note taking in art is a drawing and a drawing often is just in a book or on a scrap of paper or uh, so you do go, the, the Four Seasons started out as a drawing which was no more than maybe a foot by two feet and, and ends up, you know, this four panel painting. Uh, it's, I think if you can show Sam the first couple of little prints that you had on your series there. I will attempt to do because that. Because there are mini prints in the print. <laughs> and then I can kind of explain a little bit. This one? Right. Yes. Yes, that one. Well, in the left-hand side, there are two prints small prints in the window and in the door. And, uh, and the, the print itself, the Merci de Votre Visite, is only a foot by foot. So everything is miniaturized. Um, <clears throat> I think the challenge is to have something small have space and, and have something large have intimacy. Uh, can you go to the next, is it the next one is prints also? No. Uh, I'm afraid these are the only two okay. that we printed. That's fine. I think it was when you had the, in the, the showing and you had individual pictures, there were some other ones, but th this will do uh, right. to kind of explain. I will try to find that one. Hold on for a sec. I do know within the exhibition, because I was looking at these also, that there is a, um, a kind of reward for close looking that one um, of the mini prints that is framed individually is, is right. also a version of it included in one of the collages. Right, that's what I was going to maybe point out. Yeah, I don't know if you can. I think there were some that were just close up there, the center orange 
sort of piece. Yes. The one with has a large flower. Mm -hmm. Were you able to select that one, Sam? I'm sorry, no, we have only a few of these gallery shots and- uh... Well, I think it was, they were kind of individual picture shots after the video. Um, I'm afraid not. The, 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 the video, I did focus in on these individually. But... Okay. Yeah. Okay. But we'll just I have think... to. You'll just Everyone have to see it in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, All right. I was wondering about the approach to framing of some of the paintings, knowing that there are a couple of works in the show that have a painted frame, as well as, as you said, the one behind you. Um, can you speak about that approach? Uh, well, part of it is practical, and that is um, it's less expensive not to have a frame. <laughs> and two, the, uh, the other part of being practical is that if I was in France and I had to bring the pieces back here, uh, yeah. it was nice to not have to worry about framing mm -hmm. and a whole lot lighter and simpler to bring just the canvases. And three, I like the idea that the painting was on the wall and that the little edge that you see of the painting is painted also. So you're coming around to the the experience of the work, not just having it cut off from your reality. I mean, it's it's really a part of the space that it's in. And um, it also, for me, sort of isolates at the same time as being part of the space. It also isolates the primary part of the painting uh, to show really what what I figure is the most important thing in the in the painting. Um, I could show you another work that's behind me. Um, you could go. That uh, has a very large framing in the back, uh, and yet, I'm sorry, it's a little tippy. Uh, this, this part is the fog coming in over what's Tamalpais Mountain here, which is very prominent in this area. And uh, I don't know if I can, does that help? Trying to get it into your frame. But the framing here is a major part of the picture. Right. Framing, the framing here is as important as just the, the painting in the middle. Yeah, it's almost a, a reversal of positive and negative spaces in some senses to have right. the the middle section be lighter than the than the outside. Right, right. But I'm so I'm so interested with the fog because it sort of pours. Some days it sort of pours very languidly over the over the hills coming from the ocean, and then other times it's this rush that comes through. So. Uh, and I have a hunch there'll be more of that in my paintings. <laughs> it was, <clears throat> there was one very outstanding frame that looked like an illustrated book out of the medieval uh, oh, yes. monastery with a frame uh, design around it. I found that very, very striking. Mm -hmm. And it did wrap around the image. And of course, it had horses. Right. But I, I just love that. Can you can you bring that up, uh, Sam? Yes, I'm trying to do that right now. Okay. Yep. And I think I got it. Here yeah, we. I'd love to hear about about that frame too. Um, that is that gold leaf. Yes, it's gold leaf, and the jewels are. Um, I I spend a lot of time on pieces like this, cutting things out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's gets quite complicated. Um, but I was struck, I went to the Morgan Library, they had a show of illustrated books, and uh, illuminated books, excuse me. And the covers were amazing with these jewels. And uh, so that sort of inspired me 
because there, whoop, there's, um, there is the whole, uh, the end of the Bible that talks about the horses coming in. And I was sort of integrating this energy of the horses as well as this, the book, which could be something spiritual or uh, illuminated as a medieval book. And so, I don't know. You succeeded very well. Oh, thank you. It, it kind of is the contradiction to the incredible use of space everywhere else, because it's very contracted, mm -hmm. but very intense. But here again, this is um, a lithograph done from a really small drawing that I sort of neglected for a while and it got sort of rubbed and smeared. And so some of that ended up being part, part of the texture in the lithograph itself. Very unique. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any other questions that I could answer? People put their video, their audio on. I think Patricia Loiko has her hand up. Hello. Earlier in my life, I would have art historian friends talk about how the light was different where artists or primarily painters worked. Mm. And I didn't understand that. I just thought, isn't the sun, the sun, you know, all over the world until I started traveling and saw that, well, in fact, it was different in Paris right. than it was in Barba, in the Barbizon. Right. Is there um, a particular place where you have worked that you um, especially enjoyed the light? Definitely France. I can so easily understand why there are so many artists who certainly they've been promoted well, but uh, I think it's very true. There's a, a very different light that comes from probably the ocean on one side and the Mediterranean on the other and mountains uh, sort of surrounding France that give it something very special. Uh, so definitely France influenced me a great deal. It's the exhibition taking place at Khan College. What are some of your other upcoming projects? Obviously, the move to California itself is, is a big project, I'm sure. It's a very big project. <laughs> They're still sort of trying to settle and, you know, feel our way. But uh, it's great to have found the studio right away. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I'm struck in your work by, you know, there's sort of this interest in, in close observation of, of, you know, places that you, you have a, a deep knowledge of, um, you know, sort of observed actual trees and landscapes. And then, you know, this sort of other layer in some cases of, you know, sometimes these kind of semi-transparent horses. So this sort of, I don't know, interest in, in imaginative elements, you know, versus observed elements. And I don't know, I don't know what you, if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the meaning or, um, uh, you know, sort of what you're, just tell us a little bit more about that, that kind of layering of, of imagery is, is just very interesting. I think probably I could say that the horse is like, um, if I were doing self-portraits, it's sort of like an energy that uh, if I were if I were the horses, it would be the way I was feeling. So um, if 
if I'm doing a bucking bronco or something like that, there's that element of all of us that's sort of excited and jumping and uh, uh, I don't know, it's, to me, it's one way of expressing the emotions that we have rather than showing people as doing those emotions or uh, uh, I suppose I could do landscapes with wind blowing or, you know, dark sky or you know, different feelings that way too, but it, it just is a very expressive element for me. Mm -hmm. And that some of them are uh, more obscure or transparent. Um, it's part of it is just technically, how do I work it in, work a horse into that uh, painting and have it legitimate and part of it and or to have it the subject so it's it's kind of twofold thank you that's that's really helpful and it, it it's intriguing to think about you know this this sort of multiple layers of of, of information and you know um emotion and expression that comes into play Since we were, <clears throat> were discussing horses, mm -hmm. the image of the white horse that is cut off in front and in back with the magical um, images mm -hmm. above him, that was very intriguing. Why did you choose to truncate? Uh, it was more kind of, a, there we go. This was... I think I explained before that it was sort of, um, I was intrigued with the classical work. And often we see marble statues with heads off or wings broken and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I didn't even think of the fact that the head was gone or the horse horse's tail wasn't there, but um, perhaps if I really wanted to analyze this, it, it class, the classical began and ended and it's still sort of there. It's the, the established, it hasn't passed through the picture and it isn't coming into the picture. It's just very much there. And the, the fanciful figures in the back, I think I mentioned before, are sort of, are we jumping off, jumping off that classical place and diving into a sea that we don't we don't know anything about um and the the other figure is sort of like astonished you know is it you know what's happening um and i i'm trying to remember the date i'm um 2017 i don't know what just was uh i guess a moment where i was being contemplative about what was happening in the world and um are we jumping off of the stability of that marble classicism? I thought possibly you were <clears throat> regretting the loss hmm. of connection to whatever it is uh, well, that you consider classic. <laughs> but it is a striking image. Thank you. Thank you. I like your questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, if it's on our calendars quite yet, but we also, you know, this was <laughs> planned as a virtual program with COVID, but we're so excited that in April, Bing will be visiting Connecticut again and will be on site at the museum. I believe it's April 6th for right. a gallery talk and reception to celebrate the show. So we're, we're, Grateful that we're able to gather virtually tonight, um, especially because of we, the the driving conditions would have made made tonight tough. So we're we're extra glad we planned this as a virtual program, but we're also thrilled to see you um, in April. So thank you for for coming and and joining us in Connecticut again. Then, well, I'm I'm have the advantage of joining you, but I. 
can drive home without worry about ice. <laughs> In fact, it's very beautiful and sunny right here. So jealous. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, just the idea of uh, thinking about April already makes me feel better too. About oh, good. <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing you in person. As do we. Well, thank you so thank much you. for joining thank us. You. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. The, everyone, <laughs> yes. And we'll see all of you again, I hope, soon at the museum and uh, on screen in, as the case may be. Thank you, Eileen, for hosting this and Bing again. We're, well, we're so pleased to be able to have your work on our walls. Thank well, you. It's my pleasure. Okay. Great. Stay safe and warm, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you.